no, 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 I'm not going to talk to anything else. Okay. So, our next speaker is Matthew Gilbert from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he will talk about electron transport in strain graphene. So uh, <coughs> before I get started, I'd like to thank the organizers, in particular Dad and Dad's friend Yaro, for inviting me to this lovely conference. It's great to be back in Brazil. Um, so this is a relatively new project for me. This is something that we just started working on about a year or so ago, um, looking at um, some of these interesting transport properties in strain graphene. Um, and so these are my collaborators. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, postdoc that we had at the University of Illinois, so this is where most of this work was done, is at the University of Illinois. And um, Nadi Mason's a long-term uh, collaborator uh, who does all the experiments, and of course, like, uh, like in most other faculty members here, uh, this is work that I'm taking credit for, but it was done by a very talented student. Okay. So, um, particularly with this crowd, I don't think we need to really um, go through a whole lot of the basics of graphene, but graphene has a, a pseudo-spin degree of freedom and time reversal invariance. Um, so we can take these, these two together, and of course we can calculate the canonical band structure for graphene for low energy physics, and so we have the K and K prime points around our hexagonal, uh, hexagonal Brillouin zone. And so um, graphene obviously has these two symmetries. It has time reversal invariance, and it has particle holes, particle hole symmetry. And um, if we combine these two things together, then of course we can't open a gap because there's no way we can add an m sigma z term. We c if we had either one of these two symmetries, we could add an m sigma z term and open the gap, but the combination of these two forbids us adding the m sigma z term, and so there's no band gap that opens, and we have a stable Dirac point. <clears throat> so the interesting thing was uh, straining graphene. So straining graphene, uh, what we're planning on doing is we're planning on taking, and we have our, our normal lattice uh, displacement, and we're going to displace that from its normal position to something different. And in particular, we're going to have um, a vertical displacement and a horizontal displacement. It can be both in plane in, in any of the different directions, in plane and also out of plane. And so we can calculate the strain tensor that's based on the derivative of the in plane displacement and the out of plane displacement uh, for both the, 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 the x direction, y direction, and the cross directions. And this was something that was proposed by um, Guinea and um, Andre Gaim and, and Kostyna Vasilov. Um, so this modifies the bond length, and when we modify the bond length, um, then necessarily what we can do is we can um, modify the hopping parameter. So strain deformation necessarily is going to modify the hopping parameter that we include in our eventual Hamiltonian. So we go from this position here where we have a normal hopping, strained lattice position, and we have a, a, um, a strained lattice position where we have a new hopping parameter and a new position for the, the each of the different atoms, and this gives us a change in our hopping term, which adds a phase. This beta term is just simply a term that's um, it's added. It's, it's calculated by various different um, mechanisms, but it's a constant that we simply add to the simulations, and this is my strained position, my unstrained position, and this gives me a change in my hopping parameter. And so this adds in uh, the aforementioned pseudo vector potential. And the aforementioned pseudo vector potential then changes our description of our, our type binding Hamiltonian. This is our normal description of our type binding Hamiltonian. We have our normal hopping term, but now we have a strained hopping term. And we also have the creation of annihilation operators, our Hermitian conjugate. And so we can break it up into our bare and strained contribution to our Hamiltonian. And this is simply the change in our lattice vector. <coughs> so, if I were to take this and say, okay, the strain is not going to couple my two valleys, which means I can simply take one of my valleys and project everything down onto one particular valley, so take the K valley, project everything onto the K valley, then I have my normal low energy effective Hamiltonian, and I have my, my strain field, which will add in these different pseudo, strain, pseudo gauge field components. The I term here comes, of course, because I've now broken inversion symmetry explicitly, so I have this complex value here. <clears throat> so, in terms of calculating our, our strained effective gauge fields, then all we have to do is, as I mentioned previously, we have our unstrained lattice positions, and we look at the strain tensor, and we're able to calculate the effective uh, gauge fields in the x and y directions. And then from this, we're able to calculate our 
effective magnetic field that we induce by using strain. So this part seems pretty straightforward. And so now what we'd like to do is now we have to figure out how we can exactly strain graphene because we need inhomogeneous strain in order to be able to generate the gauge fields that are required to be able to change the electronic property of graphene. So there's a lot of evidence, and this is also something that's been pointed out already in one of the tutorials, that we can see that there's um, strain has real effects in graphene. And so the strain in graphene, graphene of course, I think the, the most obvious one is in these nanobubbles in graphene. And so the nanobubbles in graphene, we're able to see as they scan across one of the nanobubbles, they can see these Landau levels that form as a function of, of uh, the sample voltage as they scan from one side to the other, they can see persistent Landau levels forming based on the fact that we have the strain and these pseudo gauge fields. So it doesn't break time reversal symmetry, it changes sign as we go to these different valleys, but you can definitely see that we get Landau level formation. So there's other, there's other uh, types of experiments that we could do, um, things like using lip ripples, um, where we have different types of ripple patterns here, or ridges to induce strain in graphene, but um, this isn't really going to be anything that's gonna be controllable. So uh, other approaches, uh, we wanted to try and do something where we can engineer things globally. So to do so, we wanna have a uniform pseudomagnetic field all the way across um, the, the graphene sample. So we wanna be able to try to do something with fine tuning the strain. And so in this case, what we try to do is there's uniaxial strain, and this can add in a pseudomagnetic field, obviously. Uh, but this is a little bit um, uh, unrealistic in terms of an experiment. Um, so we could try triaxial strain, but again, this is also difficult to do in terms of being able to stress it in the particular way to give us this particular strain pattern. Or we can use this fan shape pattern, but same problem, it's very difficult to do. So a different approach would be to use to generate a pseudomagnetic field by using patterned substrates. And so by patterned substrates, you could use photopillar resists, or we could use um, polymers. But in, in both cases, um, the, the, the lattice constant is gonna be relatively large compared to the graphene, and, and so there's gonna be large periods of the graphene that are gonna remain unstrained. So this is maybe not the best of So. In this particular experiment, and, and one of the things I really like about this is, even though there's a lot more work that has to be done on strain graphene, this is a fairly complete picture of at least one part of the story. And so, um, it's experimentally what they do is they use uh, self-assembled silicon dioxide nanoparticles. And what this does is, so these are hexagonally close packed, so we have uh, nearly consistent modulation. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to study this on graphene because this is a, a substrate that obviously graphene is well acquainted with. And beyond this, uh, we can tune the size of these nanoparticles. So there, there's an ability because these are, these are grown, these are done by chemists. Um, so you can tune the, the size of these nanoparticles, everything from around 20 nanometers. Below 20 nanometers, it's very difficult to have controlled variability in between the sizes of the different nanoparticles. Uh, but anything between uh, 20 nanometers at the smallest and maybe 200 nanometers at the largest. So <clears throat> this, um, one of the first things we wanted to look at is make sure that we could see something interesting. And the first thing to check is to see that we can see super lattice effects uh, when we put graphene on top of these um, hexagonally close packed uh, silicon dioxide nanoparticles. Obviously, this is not going to be a crystalline arrangement. It's gonna be a quasi-crystalline arrangement or a, peri a quasi-periodic arrangement. So this is gonna be something where this is a, a good effect to check for to make sure that we're on the right track. And so if you wanna talk about graphene and super lattice effects, then there are a couple places we should start. So normally uh, this, this field sort of started where we were looking at uh, periodic modulations and electrostatic potential that would give rise to an effective um, Brillouin zone that would give us an additional uh, super lattice to rack points at uh, the edge of this uh, mini band. And so this uh, is one potential way, but the, the, the more successful way is by using Moray patterns. And so this is taking graphene and putting it on boron nitride. You could also do this if you had something that has a slightly different lattice constant, but this has obviously a, 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 low, a close lattice constant, but uh, when we think about if we just simply orient the graphene at a, short, at a small angle, then we can create these Moray patterns where we then have some um, it's got atomic precision, but it also gives us um, a new lattice constant, a super, a super lattice constant in addition to the graphene lattice constant. And uh, so we can see 
visually these uh, super lattice to rock points showing up um, at the edge of the Rewan zone as it dips in the, um, in the DIDV of the graphene. And this corresponds to uh, points where in the super lattice Rewan zone we have uh, four electrons per uh, unit cell. This corresponds to the two spin and two valley SU4 degree of freedom in graphene. So, um, but the fact of the matter is that what's really nice about this particular type of thing is um, because of the fact that the super lattice um, Brion zone or the super lattice uh, size is about 14 nanometers, then one can also think about trying to do more interesting things with this. And by more interesting, I mean trying to look for a uh, Hofstetter butterfly. So this is the self-similar relationship we're solving the Diophantine equation where we now have, we look at the, um, we, we apply a magnetic field. And so what we're looking at here is this is the calculated Hofstetter butterfly. So the other thing I forgot to mention on this previous slide, there's a big um, effect of the, having the graphene on the boron nitride here. And it's, you see that there's a big difference between electron and hole uh, sides. And the reason that there's a, an effective big difference between these electron and hole sides is because of the fact that there's a next nearest neighbor coupling that comes in between the graphene and the boron nitride that modulates uh, electrostatic potential between these two and breaks particle hole symmetry. And so this is why you get this asymmetry in the pattern. So this is the, the Landau fan diagram. And because of the fact that we have particle hole symmetry broken, we expect to see the zero, zero point gapped. But what's, what we should expect is if we have a normal Landau fan diagram, so these would be the, the filling factors, uh, we would expect everything to branch from zero and branch out. And what we can see here is it does start branching from zero, but in the higher fields then we start seeing um, incommensurate fillings um, that are not associated with the zero, the, the zero point um, or the, the charge neutrality point. And so <clears throat> there are also very interesting effects which we have not explored, but were explored um, experimentally within um, these, exper these two experiments here. Um, which we're talking about many body effects that come about because of the fact that you have very strong electron-electron interactions at high magnetic fields, and so you get other incommensurate fillings in the self-similar equation that we have that will produce this Hofstetter butterfly. And so this is just a, um, a pattern. This is the, so the, the gray pattern here is the Vanier pattern, um, and in the background you can see that the different uh, colors here correspond to uh, non-symmetry broken, symmetry broken, and incommensurate uh, different types of um, Landau patterns that we expect from the Hofstadter butterfly. Um, so just to sort of do a side-by-side -side comparison of what we, we want to do, um, if we have hexagonal boron nitride, then um, the major mechanism that gives us this super lattice periodicity that allows us to see these interesting high magnetic field effects is by potential modulation. So electrostatic potential modulation that between the graphene and the boron nitride. And so we can do the same sort of thing, but in, in, in uh, these nanospheres, uh, the modulation should be directly resulting from the strain of the graphene being draped over these nanoparticles. And so whereas the periodicity here is limited by the lattice constant, here the, 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 the periodicity of these nanospheres has, has a little bit more tunability. So in, in perhaps for like an applied sense, you could come up with a different way of and engineering using nanoparticles in a bit of an easier kind of way than you could by using boron nitride. Uh, but the difference, of course, is that the boron nitride is atomically precise, whereas the uh, for, um, for silicon dioxide nanospheres is not atomically precise. So this is the structure that they created in order to be able to measure the transport of, of the graphene draped over these nanospheres. And it's always nice, it's very rare, but it's always nice to have a picture of something real in my talk, not just like PowerPoint art. I'm unapologetically a theorist, but you know, it's, it is kind of a nice change of pace. So this is the device schematic, um, where we just have a two terminal resistance or two terminal contacts, and uh, we have the silicon dioxide nanospheres and the graphene is draped on top. Now, if we did it the other way, where we put the graphene beneath the, the silicon dioxide nanospheres, we don't see this, okay? So this is something that they have tried, but it won't see any of the sort of effects I'm gonna show you if I do the inverse. So um, when they do the, the AFM of the, of the system, then you would expect to see the, the silicon, you'd expect to see the hexagonal pattern here 
which we see, but you can see that there's also uh, more of a circular pattern, and this comes from the asymmetric coupling between the graphene and the silicon nanospheres. So when they do the uh, transport experiments, this is what they see. So this is for uh, four different samples, all of which have 20 nanometer um, silicon dioxide nanospheres it. And the way they induce the strain is by thermally cycling it. They cycle it up, cycle it back down, and then they do, and then they redo the measurements. And so you can still see these sort of um, asymmetric coupling where there's a, it seems like there's more um, super lattice Dirac point on the whole side than on the electron side, but you can definitely see evidence of, of super lattice Dirac points occurring in the, in the, the strained um, sil silicon nanoparticle system. If we were to normalize the, the conductivity on, on both the electron side and the whole side, then we can see these, these dips in the, the normalized conductivity giving rise to the we do have uh, super lattice Dirac points. So um, if we compare it again with, with the boron nitride experiment, obviously you can see some similarities between the two. So the question then was how can we rule out the fact that we have um, potential modulation rather than strain. So we want to make sure that we have strain. So there has to be some way, because silicon dioxide, the, the main source of, of, the part of the charge modulation here is going to be from uh, the contact regions in between the draped graphene and the silicon spheres. And then strain should come from the fact that in between the nanospheres, there's going to be some pushing and pulling on, on the graphene as it goes through um, peaks and valleys of the, of the silicon uh, dioxide substrate. So uh, this is where we came in, and we created a very simple um, type binding model, which contains all of the different pieces, like strain, which is talked about before from the, the, the changed bonding lengths. Uh, it comes from the potential, so we can put in the on-site potentials from the, the silicon dioxide nanospheres, and it also has the applied magnetic field that we have in the, in, the, in the system from the external source. And so this is a typical construction for anybody who's familiar with Green's functions where I have an, my, uh, my cell and then I just sort of couple the cells together and propagate this across the system. Um, in order to be able to be more precise experimentally, uh, what we had to do is we had to scale the parameters of graphene. And there's a, a nice PRL, I think, from 2007 that talks very elegantly about exactly how to scale the parameters for tight binding models of graphene in order to take it from so the nanometer scale to something that's large enough where you can say something about the, the experiments that anybody would be reasonably doing. So um, we use Green's functions. I, I'm not going to labor this slide terribly much. Um, we, the only thing I think that's maybe uh, remarkable about anything here is I just want to make sure that uh, I mentioned something about the contact. Uh, the contact, we assume it's the wide, the wide bandwidth which means that the, the density of states within particular contact is constant as a function of energy. Um, but all of the, the rest of this is, is pretty standard Green's functions that we use. Um, so first we check charge modulation. And for charge modulation, um, so this is a paper from 2009 by Mike Cromie's group. And um, this is a mapping of the, the high electron density. So you can see they have basically independent um, positions of the charge impurities in graphene. So this is on top of a silicon dioxide substrate. So we expect the same sort of thing to occur with the silicon nanoparticles where there should be charged impurities at the interface where the graphene touches the silicon nanoparticles. Or it should at least be as a function of the distance between the silicon dioxide nanoparticles and the graphene. Uh, but if you go to lower electron densities, obviously this, this picture of, of independent electron um, concentrations for impurities doesn't hold up and you need to think about something like electron puddles um, where you have these puddles of impurities where they overlap. And so to accommodate that, then you can change this to an impurity potential that has, it's summed over all of the impurities, but now instead of having individual impurities as delta functions, we use an exponential Gaussian that allows us to sort of map in between this region where we have puddles and this region where we have individual impurities. Um, so we have to fix the charge puddle size, and so for us it's a couple of nanometers, but um, you can sort of see that the, this, this charge puddle size and the, the, the strength of these interactions depends uh, quite a bit on the distance of the graphene sheet from the, um, from the, the charged impurities. So um, this is the model that we're using here. So this is the, the dashed line is a self-consistent theory taken from this paper. I did not make this calculation. 
but you can see that it, it follows the, the data quite nicely, this approximation for the impurity potential that we're going to put into the Green's functions. And in order to be able to be very accurate about what we're doing with uh, the, this modeling, what we do is we actually take the, the actual SEM of the, um, of the uh, silicon dioxide nanospheres beneath the graphene, and we take this and we literally make a map where we map a ratio between zero and one, um, where we put this into the expression for the impurity concentration that tells me whether or not I'm on top of the silicon nanoparticle or whether I'm in between the, the silicon nanoparticles. So I actually am mapping in the exact pattern of the silicon nanoparticles into my simulation for graphene. And so what we wanted to do then is we wanted to sort of simulate the exact concentrations of electrons that they have in the graphene uh, for the experiments. And so to do that, we had to come up with a way where we could take the number of impurities that we have from the SEM pattern and change the device area and use this as our variable to try and match up with the experimentally measured um, electron patterns, electron concentrations in the graphene. And so these are the experimentally measured values. And so this is uh, the real space um, picture of the, of the charged impurities in the system. And we can go to, to higher and higher impurity densities. And you can see already what you probably expect. We expect that for realistic, impure, realistic uh, densities, um, we expect there to be no pattern that shows up in the Fourier transform of my, um, of my real space signal of my uh, charged impurities, which would indicate to me, just without even having done the calculation, that I expect to see no super lattice appear in this case. Whereas out here, you see a very pattern. It's circular here because of the coupling between the, the substrate and the, the graphene. Um, we sort of put that in a little bit by hand, so I wouldn't expect there to be a hexagonal pattern, but we expect to see the circular pattern. And when we do the calculation, um, it turns out that, uh, so this is the, the, the gray is without the modulation from the silicon dioxide nanoparticles, and the, the red is with. And we can see that, the, that there's not really a whole lot of change. And in fact, for the, the reasonable electron densities, um, we don't see any pattern formation of super lattice effects. So um, the, the densities where we see uh, super lattice effects start to form is more than an order of magnitude different than the experiment. So this sort of led us to believe that, in fact, charge density wasn't the, the predominant uh, mechanism that drives this. So we wanted to do strain modeling. And for strain modeling, it's a little bit more complicated than doing the um, uh, impurity modeling. So what we had to do is we, we took that same SEM pattern and we mapped it up like the height. And then the height, from the height, what we could do is we could figure out what the, um, the displacement was in plane and, and out of plane. And so we can then reassemble the strain tensor. And by reassembling the strain tensor, what I mean is I can use the displacement in the x direction and y direction along with the vertical displacement in order to be able to reconstruct exactly what this pattern should be. So we know this from the, from the, from the STM patterns, but we don't know this, so we need to find a way of backing that out. And so this is uh, really a, a sort of clever insight from my student. Um, and so what he, he determined is that um, for the in-plane modeling, uh, there were some papers that talked about how the strain of different materials should go if you were to clamp uh, the force at one particular and allow the rest of the material to float. And so in this case, um, for, for gold and copper, you can see how the, the, there's, if you clamp it at one point, then if I lay, let it relax, then, then there's going to be some strain in these materials. And so there's going to be some in-plane strain and some out-of-plane strain. And so if we were to just sort of a priori, there's no derivation for this equation whatsoever. Um, what we want to do is we want to calculate sort of like the free energy. And it's a change in the, the, the height of my pattern. And so this is going to be proportional to minus, so minus in order to keep consistency between uh, the equations. Um, the unstrained uh, lattice constant of graphene and the derivative of the height will give us some information about the change in the um, in-plane strain. So change if I go from unstrained position to a different type of height, then as I go for the different change in height, then I expect to see a shift in the in-plane strain. And so the hope was that this equation would give us some um, idea as to exactly what the in-plane lattice uh, structure was going to be doing. And so we tried to compare this with two known analytic examples where I took graphene, a small sheet, and spread it over a nanoparticle or over a sphere. 
And uh, the other example, the two limits, the other limit is if I just have a large sheet draped over a small sphere. And so if I uh, look at the, the strain patterns in between the two, then you can see that this uh, very simple equation uh, interpolates nicely in between the two where I can fit the, the strain patterns that I, I see from the graphene sheet and the graphene disk quite nicely um, as, as long as I tune this, this, um, pro this parameter here, which tells me something about the, the coupling um, between the, the, the disk and the, um, and, the, and the graphene. So um, when we do the strain calculations, put this strain model in, uh, what we can very clearly see is that um, as we increase the amount of strain, so we go from low strain to high strain, and by high strain, I don't mean something ridiculously large. So these are all um, experimentally close values. And so the, for the percent change in, in the last constant, it's about 0.43%, but at its highest, um, and um, that gives us a, a magnetic field of about 7.5 Tesla from the pseudo, uh, pseudo gauge field. And these are different couplings between the, the graphene and the silicon nanoparticles. So um, when we check our simulations with the boron nitride, of course we see that the, they're similar. We get the, the super lattice Dirac points. Here they're symmetric because I don't have that asymmetric coupling in the next nearest neighbor term in my, in my tight binding model. Uh, so we, we expect it to be symmetric on either side, and it is, but uh, it still reproduces the graphene and boron nitride experiments quite nicely. Um, so if we do the same thing with the, the nanoparticle experiments, we can see that um, it's very close. Um, and when uh, we go a little bit different uh, distance, so we want to plot out the, now I apply the perpendicular magnetic field, and we check the uh, Hofstadter butterfly. And sure enough, so for the unstrained, it was no nanospheres, then we expect to see that, um, so here's the, the, zero, the zero lambda level, and we see the different filling factors. Everything originates from this charge neutrality point. Whereas with the nanospheres, now we start to see effects of super lattice Dirac points as we strain the super lattice and apply the magnetic field. So we definitely see difference in the Hofstadter pattern. So if we were to compare our calculated Hofstadter pattern with the experiment, then we get very good agreement between the two. So in conclusion, um, I'm even gonna wrap up like a minute early. So um, what we did is we, there were some really interesting experiments on, on transporting graphene. And um, in order to explain and in order to be able to clarify whether or not we're looking at strain effects or we're looking at charge modulation effects, came up with a very nice tight bonding model that correlated excellently with, with uh, the experiments. And so based on this, we were able to rule out charge modulation as the main source of the super lattice effects. And we can say that um, with a fair degree of certainty that in these um, silicon nano uh, particle um, strained graphene systems that it is the strain that's really playing the role of creating the, the super lattice effects. So um, with that, I will say uh, thank you very much. We have questions.